Hi, everybody. My name is Larry Thomas, and I'm an alcoholic. And I want to thank you for that uh, introduction. I'm uh, expecting a little more than that. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm glad to be with you guys this morning. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a great conference up till now. And uh, I'm here to lower the bar so Chris won't have any trouble at all this morning, you know. I, uh, I'm a loser. I... Uh, <laughs> I'm a hostile loser, and uh, and I want to hurry up and get this done so I can have some me time, you know. I, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I want to thank the MC for all those lovely announcements. We could have listened to them all morning, you know. And in fact, we damn near did. I, uh, I see that we were sharing the hotel with the California farm laborers. Uh, that's not bad. I, uh, it wasn't too long ago I was uh, sharing the, the conference with uh, 1,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. I had a tremendous desire to get up early in the morning and go grab a big book and go door to door. Bill and Bob love you. You know, just uh, don't hold back. You know, <laughs> um, but I'm glad to be with you. I, uh, my sponsor tells me that I'm living proof that a man can stay sober for a little over 30 years and not amount to a goddamn thing. I. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know where you think you're going if you're new. Um, uh, but the highest I've ever gotten here is sober, basic human being, active member of my own home group. Now, I've got some hope for you. I, uh, I didn't sleep good last night, and um, I obviously wasn't thinking about you. That's for damn sure, you know what I mean? But I did notice that around 3.30 in the morning, I was watching CNN. And uh, if you're new, they came out uh, with a cure for alcoholism in Switzerland. Not Ireland. <laughs> and it comes in the form of a pill. So hang in there, you guys. There's hope on the horizon, you know. Now, my first thought is I wondered what two would do. And can you crush them up, maybe? You know what I mean? You just, just get this thing going, man, you know. I, uh, for many years, I thought that this step read, turn your life and your will over to God. And if I could do that, please tell me why was it necessary for the other steps. Why would it be necessary for me to do anything? Up to this point, Bill Wilson is thinking that you're following him right along. That last paragraph in the 12 and 12 on the first step, under the lash of alcoholism, we stood ready to do anything to lift this merciless obsession. I can't think of a better term for this disease that we have than merciless. It's as selfish as me. <laughs> It does not need its permission to kick my ass, nor does God need my permission to work in my life, but he would certainly like my cooperation. I've never been to cooperate with anything. I, uh, I have no reason whatsoever that I can think of what makes me so selfish. I wasn't brought up that way. I come from some great folks. I was born in Detroit and uh, brought up in a little foster home for a little period of time. And my mom and dad got together. And my mom's a sweet lady. My mom's a little Scandinavian lady. And, uh, and my mom loved diet pills. My mom was always running around the house every morning, sorting out nuts and bolts in the garage around 3 in the morning or raking the neighbor's yard around midnight, you know, and... Uh, Every now and then she'd grab the lawnmower and just do the whole block, you know, just take off. And she used to eat that speed and make afghans. And uh, 
Everything in the house had fresh Afghans on it. The chairs had Afghans, the couches had Afghans, my dad's golf clubs had little poodle heads, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and no matter what time you got up, she was up doing shit, you know, cleaning with your toothbrush, you know, and uh, just a busy lady, you know. And the house was small, and she had a little private room, and you can just hear her all night, just like a little sewing machine, man, you know. And her favorite hobby was to, uh, well, she had a lot of them, you know, but, uh, but she would eat that speed, and she used to love to make these huge jigsaw puzzles, right? These 30 million piece jigsaw puzzles of the Mojave Desert. And that's, this would excite her, you know. It's going to be a beige night tonight, honey, you know. And uh, she'd get her muumuu on and head down to the drugstore and get her new prescription, get her proxide and, you know, get her 330 million piece puzzle, you know. And, and she used to buy Raleigh cigarettes because she saved the coupons to buy more yarn. It was a hideous cycle she was caught up in, you know. That, and she would run home and, you know, start eating that speed and putting together this puzzle. And by golly, if she got a piece that didn't fit, well, she had a big pair of toenail clippers. She just snipped that son of a bitch down, you know, <laughs> wedged that thing in there, you know. I love my mom. To this day, I, I, I love my mom. And what was to happen to me and Alcoholics Anonymous, you guys would start me on this fact-finding process. Fact-finding process with no longer are we using the word blame. And I would get together with the sponsor. And you would begin to see, without even writing about it yet, you would begin to see how selfish and self-centered you'd been your entire life. Things that had kept you up at night were now coming out. And I remember this sweet lady. I remember her well. I love her today. And I can see at a young age how my selfishness and self-centered would start. You see, I would see what it would do with people who would give me love and attention and affection. A compassionate gesture like that. And what would I do with people like my mom who would give me love and compassion? I would play her like a fiddle. That there would never be a time too inconvenient or an age too old. Right? For me not to put the tap on that dear lady. And I never want to forget that. I never want to forget what it's like to be a young man, 18, 19 years old, and put away for a small period of time. And when you come out, you're supposed to show up on Monday. But you don't show up on Monday. No. You show up on Thursday. You don't show up at home. No, you show up at your mom's place of business. You see, she's working in a dry cleaners, and she's cleaning people's homes, and you're embarrassed, and you're ashamed of her. But you're not too ashamed to show up that morning. You're not too ashamed to show up in a parking lot about 9 o'clock in the morning and my mom from about here to that wall. And I'm standing in this April rain around 9 o'clock in the morning with my drunken mud on and that rain's hitting my face. And the only thought that I have is she better have a buck. And I waddle through that rain. Go into that lady's place of business and one more time startle her with my presence. Which would be an ongoing thing in that little lady's life. And without batting an eye, she'd peel off that $1 and $2, and I'd take that money and run off to Wilmington where I'm going to die. Now the thing that brings it home to me this morning with you is you take this same man and you put me in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, like your home group or mine, where every action that I take, my life depends on here, if you be alcoholic. And I need to ask you this, new ends. How come when my life depends on it, with my so-called desperation and willing to go to any length, if you were to put the secretary of a meeting that same distance, how come when my life depends on it, I can't walk that distance and ask a man in a meeting for a job or a commitment in a meeting that's going to save my life, but I can walk that distance and use my mom time and time and time again. And I'm here to share with you, if you're new, that it's been my experience, and that's all I got here. I am no authority. I don't got a bunch of classes and pamphlets on this shit. <laughs> all I know is this, that if my alcoholism doesn't kill me, my selfishness and my self-centeredness will. Make no mistake about that. Which is why it's necessary with some goof with over 30 years to still have a job in every meeting that he has. Not so that I can run off to Vegas and brag about it, but for one reason and one reason only. 
I will never get so sober that I can't get drunk again. But I can get so drunk that I can't make it back. And I never want to forget what it's like to be in Southern California, peering through every windows and all these Alano clubs and meetings, and wondering if I'll ever be in the middle of this thing called life. Because you were life to me. You are my life this morning. I knew I had glimpsed. I knew that I had wandered in something that I wanted to be part of. And this constant feeling of being different and never being able to, to, to feel a part of anything. And if I can get together with a sponsor and this book and you people and find out what that thing is that keeps me from serving you, I will have found a key to life. Because once I began to serve the thing I wanted so much from, I couldn't keep it from bleeding in every area of my life. You see, but I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. I don't know nothing about serving. I'm a something-for-nothing guy. Turning my life and my will over to the care of God is more like, okay, what are you going to do for me now? I'll just sit back and when you are lazy like me, that was one of the, my dad was a happy drunk, man. My dad was a happy singing the blues and that King Cole Bobby Darren drunk. This guy used to drink and sneak into his own damn home. It was an amazing thing, man, you know. Always through my bedroom window, too. He'd have these big refinery boots on. He snuck in there one night. That big old boot came in there, stepped right on my throat. I grabbed that little boot and I said, Dad, I said, you know, why don't you have, you know, Mom make you a key for God's sake, you know. <laughs> my hell, she's up anyway. You know, I can hear the Hoover going now, for God's sake, you know. And this guy, this guy reeked of, of you know, just character. You know, I, mean, I mean, he started things and finished them. You know, I don't have that push in me. You know, I, 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 I got a five inch belt of lazy ass that straps around here where, you know, the only thing I'm pushing for is my nap every day. You know what I mean? I, I wake up thinking about the son of a bitch. You know, everything, everything works around two thirty in my life. You know, I don't know how to push through things. I don't know how to hang in, you know. Don't threaten me with a 401k, for God's sakes. I'm out of here, you know. (laughs) I don't have what it takes to hang. I don't have that in me. And if I can find out that thing that keeps me from serving you, but a something-for-nothing guy, that's what I've been my entire life. Give me that bottle, I'll pay you later. Give me that dope, I'll pay you later. Give me that sparkle in your eye, I'll do what I have to do later. Always got my hands out, you know. My mom, she used to, this block that I had about a God, I didn't know for a long time what that was about. But I felt so ashamed growing up that I didn't trust these people that I was supposed to be loving. I felt so ashamed about that. You see, my mom was being pushed around early in the morning. And I can hear him yelling, and my my dad was doing the pushing. And I felt so guilty that I wasn't able to stop that. And I'm four years old. And my dream was to grow up and beat him up. That's all I dreamt about was getting even with that son of a gun. I didn't want anything to do with him. And I didn't know how to hide that, so I pleased him. I tried to people please him. I tried to play baseball. I tried to do good in school. And I got this tremendous thing, and I ain't... I'm just doing it so he don't hit me. I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. I just don't want him coming after me. And he would. He'd come after me and I'd help him pick the weapon, what he was going to use on me. I didn't know what to do with all that. My dad came into my bedroom when I'm about seven, six or seven years old. And he says, you're going to have a baby brother. Man, I start oiling up my glove. I start saving my baseball card, Steve, thinking about that kid brother. I start thinking about how we're going to go to the drag races in the beach and get away from that old man. I'll protect that kid. Nine months later, the old man comes into my room. He says, your baby brother died. I don't remember having any compassion for my mom or for that terrible incident. I do remember going after the old man with all 60 pounds, telling him that he promised me 
You promised me. And I started swinging at the old man. I started blaming him for something he had no power of. Now, more important than what it did to me than this was I had this idea what type of God would create a baby and kill it. I don't want nothing to do. See, my mom was brought up in a convent. She told me about what they did in those places. My dad was of no religion. He couldn't stand it. He said, they're just a bunch of money-grubbing people, <laughs> you know. And he wanted nothing to do with it. And what type of God would create a kid and kill it? And I didn't want nothing to do with him. I didn't want nothing to do. And I had so many questions. And I didn't trust my mom. And I didn't trust my dad. And at 11 years old, and I didn't trust this God. I had so many questions. But I knew at 11 years old, it was up for me to figure this stuff out. I've got to muster up something and figure this thing out. And it was up to me. And I grabbed the reins. I started taking control of my life. And the first thing that I did is I made a right turn. No longer was it necessary to make that old man happy anymore. And I remember that turn just as quick as we did when we got off at Las Vegas Boulevard, man. I remember it to this day. That it put to me in this head, you know what, dude? I've had it with you. And at 11 years old, there was four of us, and we went in a garage, and we started passing around a bottle of Four Rose Whiskey. And my God, I found the safe place. The Alki finally found a safe place. A sense of well-being, if you will. A sense of ease and comfort that came over me, that took away any doubt, any fear, any screwed up self-centered feeling I had about me. And I stepped into this beautiful window that would be my safe place. And I'll never forget that first drunk for as long as I live, man. I never laughed so hard my entire life. I never threw up so much my entire life. I was throwing up shit I ate when I was nine months old, for God's sakes, man. You know, just hurling groceries, man, you know. You know, I kissed my first Latin woman, you know. It was my aunt, you know, but hell, I counted it, man. I went after her, you know. I mean, and I etched a spot. I etched a safe place, man. I found my spot. And I grew up like you guys, trying to believe the lie that we all were trying to believe and couldn't figure out when we got to AA. That lie that people have been telling us our entire life. And I, I just couldn't put it together. And you guys know the lie because we've been hearing it our entire life. If you stop drinking, everything would be all right. If you would stop drinking, you wouldn't go through this. Everything would come together. And by golly, if you're in this room, you know darn well that that ain't the truth. In the doctor's opinion, he says, the only answer we have is entire abstinence. Right? This starts a seething cauldron of debate. You bet. Who's debating? The Alkies. <laughs> abstinence just drives us so damn mad that we can't wait to drink again. See, I'm an alcoholic. The memory of my last drunk doesn't have sufficient force to keep me sober. I'm in the grips of a progressive. It has me. I don't have it. And the memory of my last drunk, no matter how nasty it is, no matter how many pigs I'm rolling around with, no matter how long I'm in that gutter, for some reason it doesn't have sufficient force to keep me sober. And I'm thinking I'm going to learn a lesson. But isn't it amazing that the pain and the memory of my last drunk is pushed aside by the pain that I feel when I'm not drinking? And the only thing that not drinking has ever squeezed out of me is this idea that drove me to the gates of insanity and death. This time it'll be different. I've got to find a way to keep this stuff in my life if it's the last thing that I do. I never thought about getting rid of it. I thought about what I can add to it. What can I do to make Maybe it's some reds and some whiskey. Maybe it's some 151 and some heroin. There's got to be a come. But the idea of leaving it alone never entered my mind because I know what I'm like when I'm not drinking. And the older I got, the more afraid I got. My life is run on fear. To this day, I get scared like a, I just like a little, just, I'm just get scared easy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm thinking that going to go, hell, I was in this, these hotel rooms. I'm, and, and, and I go into the shower and the shower head starts spinning. Scared the shit right out of me, man, you know? I thought it's good. And I'm a plumber. I'm thinking the things that, I know what's happening. This thing's going to spin off and flood, man. I got out of that shower. I'm running around naked, you know. She's going to blow, you know.
Hell, I'm, I'm run by self-will today, man. That first letter in the third step in the 12, it says practicing, practicing. And I mean practicing, <laughs> man. It's, I, you know, and, and when something, when I get afraid, I don't feel like asking help. I got to figure this stuff out, my first instinct. My poor little wife, man, you know. Not too long ago, she told me she's having a hot flash. I don't know what a hot flash is, and I don't want to ask. You know what I mean? I don't know what a hot flash is. She's laying in bed, and, and she calls me up at, you know, at work. I'm having a hot flash. I'm thinking it's a horny flash. You know, she's Mexican. You know, she's Latin. She, you know, it's a hot flash. She's getting, you know, she's getting the hornies, you know. And I'm thinking, what the hell is she doing at work getting a hot flash? You know, she's got the hunk at home. You know what I mean? And she told me the other night, and I figured, okay, she's having the hot, the hot, the horny flashes. I says, that's why they make Viagra and stuff. Is so when they have the horny flash, you're there and you're ready. You know what I mean? And not too long ago, this poor thing, she don't know what's going on with me. You know what I mean? And she says, not till she's laying in bed. We're home from our Monday night meeting. She says, oh God, I'm having a hot flash. Really? You know? <laughs> Got the candles out, ran into the shower, shaved everything. You know what I mean? Just electrically, you know. Got the candles out, was already lathered up and shit like that. I come out of there and she's asleep. She's knocked out. And I already took the, the thing. I'm laying in bed and the pup tent's up. And I'm going... Oh, shit, what am I doing, man? I'm getting up, wandering around, bumping that thing into everything. It felt like a stubbed toe, you know what I mean? That following morning, I get a lady calls me from the group. She says, my husband's drunk and he's fallen out of bed. I says, I've got the perfect idea, man. Give him one of those. It's like a kickstand. He ain't going to. Boom. Boom. You know what I mean? I've got to figure this stuff out, you know. But that's how I operate, man. I got to figure this stuff out because I'm a nothing. I'm a nothing inside. I have no answers. I have no answers for anything. I know I'm inadequate. I know I, I, I'm a piece of crap. You know, you, people tell you it long enough, you believe it. And I knew I was convinced I would never amount to anything, man. And the older I got, the more I leaned on that stuff, man. And by the time I'm in high school, you know, I'm a freshman in high school and people are hooking up with people. And I start dating this little Mexican girl and she had some brothers and they like lowered cars. And I love lowered cars. I love cars today. And we had our 62 Chevys drop right to the ground, man. Had my hair up real big like a Bakersfield tumbleweed, you know. <laughs> We'd drive around and listen to the Four Tops and the Temptations and Marvin Gaye. And God, I loved it, man. I was in my plumbing truck the other day and the Four Tops came on. I had to start sinking in my damn truck, man, you know. <laughs> had my white T-shirt and black tacky pants that came up to here. The girls were telling me that men who are well endowed had big feet. I had a pair of 15-inch shoes I was wearing. Had my big hair, my big feet, you know, and I felt proud. Somebody tripped over my foot tonight, this morning, and I felt proud. <laughs> Let me move that thing. It's going to be a while, you know. I loved it, man. That little puke finally became somebody, man. And I'd bounce around with these guys all my life. And by the time I got into... 69, everybody was going places, and I thought, well, I would grab my buddies, and we would bounce off to Detroit and find my roots. And uh, we landed in Phoenix, and bounced off to Phoenix, man, over there at North Central and Roosevelt at the Apache Hotel. Everybody's got five floors, and everybody's got a TV. It's in the lobby. Everybody's got a bathroom. It's down the hall. It's $30 a month, and I don't have the money. But I'm looking out that window and I'm drinking and I'm dying. And I know one of these days he ain't going to be like that. I'm drinking that Thunderbird wine and I can't sleep and I'm afraid to be in there by myself. I got the shakes that shake the whole bed. I got blood coming out of everywhere. 
And I'm afraid to be alone and I'm afraid to go outside. And all I can do is look out that window at the wagon wheel bar because that's where my that's where my hope is. And the wagon wheel doesn't have any windows. It's just a dirty curtain blowing through that window. And I go into that little place and I feel, and meet a guy named Ernie. Ernie says, I know what we're going to do, Larry. Not too far from here. He says, uh, I know a plumber. Come in in the morning. We'll put you to work. And that man introduced me to a plumber. He took me out in the desert, stuck me underneath the house. He says, all I want you to do, kid, is hang copper. That's all I want you to do. And he came back and he says, I'll come back in nine hours and pick you up. And he gave me a transistor radio to take under there. And I'm underneath this house and I got a PM bourbon bottle, a little pint. And I look over underneath the house and I see this cat way over there. And it dawned on me, man, I'm on top of the world. I got made under here. I got a transistor. I got a pint. I got a pet. You know, and I... <laughs> I'm going to start throwing back this bourbon and doing some plumbing, you know. Well, apparently I drank that whole pint and I robbed the lady. I busted up through the floor, robbed her of all of her jewelry. They're dragging me out. This cat comes running out with a bunch of necklaces on, you know. I get fired from that job. Go back to the bar. Ernie says, I know what we're going to do. He says, not too far from here is a horse track. He says, we're going to get you down to 95 pounds. You're going to be a, a jockey. And I said, I figure we're going to start working out and stuff like this, right? And uh, he gives me a bag of speed. I don't do speed. I just drink wine and do heroin. I mind my own business. I, you know, I'm not going to be no Afghan maker. That's for damn sure, you know. No, no, no. You just take this and we'll come back in two months and go weigh you in, you know. And he was sure it was going to work. And he took off. He comes back two weeks later, right? I haven't moved an inch. I'm... You know, I, I don't want to be a jockey, Ernie. I'm going faster than any damn thing I've ever seen in my life. You can, you can put a saddle on me and ride my ass around here, you know. And I'm stuck in this little room, and all I'm doing is chasing a fly around my room and looking out the little window every ten seconds. What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? You know. Seeing these horrendous black and white flashes, which was the sun going up and down, is what it was, you know. What the hell is that, man, you know. Not too long after that, I, uh, I started working for this other plumber, and the guy was a, I don't know, I guess I worked for him about two hours, and uh, <laughs> wore me out. <laughs> and the guy was younger than me, and I said, you know, I ain't working for no kid. I've got my pride. And so I did what any honorable man would do. I faked a knee injury. Went down to the county hospital, and they gave me a prescription for Percodan. And the doctor left the room with, uh, and he left me with a box of prescription pads that he wanted me to have. So I, running down North Central with my box of prescription pads, ducked into the old wagon wheel bar. Ernie looks at these things. He makes a call to some guy in Arizona in Tucson, and we start writing prescriptions and selling them. Start writing prescriptions for second all and two and all and all that stuff. And after about nine months, they caught up with me. And when you're loaded on barbiturates and, uh, and whiskey and wine, there's no freeway chase. You know, <laughs> there he goes down to 10. Look at that son of a bitch go. You know, nothing. It, it didn't happen like that. They got me. I was going nine miles an hour. <laughs> the cop was just walking by. So they arrested me and convicted me and put me away for a small period. I'm no big time convict. I'm a punk loser. And they put me in this uh, place for a short period of time. And in 1974, I took a Continental Trailways to California and went to the L.A. City Hall and registered with the probation department. They put me on abuse. In 1974, I'm on antabuse. And for the first time in my life since I'm 13, I don't have a thing in my system. And I'm at the Greyhound Hotel in downtown Torrance. And my probation officer gives me a, a call saying that he's got a job interview that he wants me to go on to be a janitor part-time at a refinery in El Segundo and to take the bus over there. And I took the bus over there. And I'm about two and a half hours early. And I go into this little league dugout, stone cold sober, and go absolutely out of my mind. Not a thing in my system become hysterical, somewhat maniacal. My paranoia gets so intense that the hallucinations start coming and they stick, become somewhat catatonic, and I don't know what to do, but somebody calls the paramedics. They take me to the Harbor General Hospital in Carson, California. 
they look at uh, my jacket and they seem to see the thing that maybe with some of the incidents that have been going on with me and maybe I need to go to a state hospital and be observed for 30 or 60 days. So they sent me out to this little hospital out there by Oxnard. And a year later, they let me out, totally observed. <laughs> we couldn't find anything in there, you know. And, uh, and they gave me some medication to take away these certain things. And they, one thing you can't medicate away in an alcoholic is this idea that this time it's going to be different. And after about two or three months, they ran out of Thorazine and some other things, and they found me at Overall Street in downtown Los Angeles behind the Chevron gas station in 1975, curled up like a dead dog. No big-time convict. They rolled me up on a violation. They sent me up to Wayside. I'm up at Wayside for about 50 or 60 days, and they put about 60 of us in a black-and-white bus and send us down to the South Bay Courthouse. <laughs> Sent me down to the South Bay Courthouse where I'm going to be tried and convicted and sent away for two and a half years in the state penitentiary. And I'm in a holding tank about the size of this little room right here. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, everybody's gone. All the other guys are gone. All the buses are gone. And I'm on a concrete floor with a Vons bag and no hope. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, a Scottish man with a patch came into this jail and he said, are you Larry Thomas? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He says, come with me, son, you're going to AA. And I said to myself, what's AA? I've heard of OR and PO, but what's AA, you know what I mean? (laughs) Who's this Scottish pirate all of a sudden, you know? (laughs) And looking back well over 30 years, I know exactly what he is. He's what we call a trusted servant. What would make that man a trusted servant? In my heart and my soul. He had no business being there. He was not a panel. He wasn't part of H and I. Wasn't a counselor, wasn't a probation officer. He was a little refinery worker who just got the worst news of his life. And that news was that his wife was dying immediately of a terminal disease. And he knew she was in good hands, but he knew he wasn't. Ah, but somewhere in his home group. Somewhere in his Monday night meeting in Bellflower, California. Somewhere in his Wednesday night meeting in Brentwood. Somewhere in his Thursday night meeting in Carlsbad. That man was able to grasp and develop a matter in living that brained in him this. That practical experience tells us that nothing will ensure immunity from drinking than intensive work with other alcoholics. That this works when other activities fail. And that thought came across his mind and he whipped his little car around and he head off to the South Bay Courthouse and he talked to Judge Foy and Judge Hollingsworth. And they said, I think we got a guy for you. And that man took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was ready for a long ride up north and maybe some lunch, Lee. You know what I mean? He takes me for a 15-minute car ride to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. A 15-minute car ride. And he rolls up to this dingy, stinky, rotten, smelly, pukey, filthy, Torrance Lamita Alano Club. I said, my God, what's an Alano? You know, is that like an elk or a moose or something like that? You know, watch for crossing Alanos. And he pulled up to this club, and there they were. All the Alanos were walking around, man. (laughs) Everybody had a nickname and a tattoo. They're trying to get a cup on the wall or some shit, you know. And he introduced me to all these people, Indian Genie and Captain Bob and Tennessee Bill and Singing Sam and Serenity Sam and Bicycle Ray and Santa Claus Ray and Dancing Pete and Whistling Butt and all these other people. I said, my God, I've just left a group of people like this, you know. And... Little Moose comes running down. Hi, honey, my name is Moose, and I'm expecting a miracle. I said, I bet you are. I said, I'm not it, man. (laughs) Some big transvestite came out of the card room. He starts circling me like a helicopter in Norwalk. (laughs) He's like... About his third time around, he lands. He comes walking up to me in his new moo and he says, Hi, I can't wait to take you to our candlelight meeting. (laughs) Candlelight meeting? I don't think so, big guy. Not till I get a year anyway. (laughs) I told Alex, I said, God damn, that guy's got big feet. What's wrong with him? And from 1975 to 1982, I came in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis. 30 days and get drunk. (sighs) 
60 days and get drunk. 90 days and get drunk. And the longest I could stay sober was six months because I was on heroin. (laughs) Took the edge off. (laughs) And the biggest lie that I was telling myself was that I was coming in and out of AA. I hadn't touched you folks. I did what I've been doing my entire life. My entire life, from the time I was 13 to the time I was 30, I was sitting in rooms from the state or the county, sitting in rooms waiting for you to do something for me. I've had my hand out my entire life waiting for county checks and blocks of cheese and bus passes. And that's what I did here. Nothing changed. I sat in these rooms waiting for something to happen to me. I've had my hand out my entire life. And I come to Alcoholics Anonymous with the same attitude. What are you going to do for me? And what I was waiting to be done to me, God was waiting to do through me. There is a miracle here. There is a miracle here. And it's nothing that I can bring about myself. But it is something that I must do something about. And my whole attitude about turning my life and my will over to the care of God is I got to figure this stuff out. I'll just get physically sober and get my life together. I was so afraid to turn my life and I had no conception that book talks about turn your life and your will to the care of God. I don't know nothing about care. I wouldn't know care. I've been into me caring for me. I didn't know nothing about trust. And I came in and out of these rooms, never once getting a part of this thing, only thinking that if I would get physically sober, everything would be all right. And every time I called you, somebody would come and get me. Somebody would call and get me. And on May 2nd, 1982, I'm in downtown Wilmington. I'm at the Beacon Light Mission. I look at myself on this Woolworth window and I see the thing and the thing's 120 pounds and he's yellow. I look at myself and I'm, my God, whatever happened in my dreams, I never had any dreams. The only dreams that I had was maybe this time it'll be different. And I did what I always did like that. I panhandled some money and I called Alcoholics Anonymous. And who do I get? I get this guy named Don Adamson, this bald headed carpenter. And every time I called, he would come and get me. And I panhandled that money and I said, Don, I'm ready to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. Will you come and get me? And he told me the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. He said, no. He says, you know where we are. You know what we got. Why don't you get your rusty rear down here yourself? I'm tired of chasing after you. And he hung up. And I said, my God, whatever happened to that AA love? (laughs) I just heard it. I had just heard it. And for the first time in my life, it was up to me to come to you. And I went around that corner that day. And I started crying. Because everything in me wanted to stay sober. Everything in me wanted to stay sober. And I came to believe that morning. And I didn't come to believe in God. I didn't come to believe in you. I didn't come to believe in the big book or my sponsor. No, something happened to me that morning. I came to believe in the hopelessness and the futility of my life at that moment. And it didn't come to me in those words. It came into me, it'll never change. You will always be like this because you are powerless not to. I am like a tail on a kite. It's just a matter of the wind hitting me. No matter how bad I want not to drink, I'm going to get drunk again. That was my biggest fear when I got sober. I had this fear that I was going to get drunk again. And as I stand before you this morning in Las Vegas, I don't have that fear. I know I will. I know I will. We were talking about Bill Wilson all morning, and and at that morning, I took the longest walk of my life. I walked that 10 miles with my poopy pants and no hope. And I waddled into an Alano club that didn't want me there. And I asked for Don. I said, is Don here? And they said, he's in the back of the coffee room. And I asked that man something I never asked a man in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, Don, I don't know what to do with my life. Would you be my sponsor? That was my third step. I had no conception of a God. But I had a man in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a human being. 
I had somebody right there. And I trusted that man and I turned my life and my will over to the care of this bald headed carpenter. Because I'll do whatever he says not to wind up like that again. I was so afraid I was going to drink. He took me over to this club and he told me to wait there. And he says, and at that Thursday night meeting, I stood up and I said, my name is Larry Thomas. I'm an alcoholic. And after the meeting, I thought Don was going to take me to back to the mission. And he says, you're coming home with me, kid. Really? He said, yep, you're going to stay at my house. All right, man. You know, I start smelling the waffles already, you know. <laughs> and he brought me over to his place and he and he stuck me in this abandoned camper he had. It was up on blocks. He says, you climb into that camper there and you, you stay there. And if you leave that camper tonight, I'm going to have you arrested. And I'm thinking, my God, take me back to the mission, for God's sake. You know what I mean? <laughs> And he slammed the door and he took off. And then he come back in there and he opened up that little door and he says, why you're in there, hot shot? He says, you better find a God. And he slammed the door again. <laughs> now, I'm in this little abandoned camper shell and I'm thinking, well, where are you going to find a God in here? You know, is, is he in the glove box, you know, or something like that? And about four o'clock in the morning, I was watching the trees breathe and it, and it dawned on me. You know what? I'll do whatever this guy says, not for me to wind up like this again. This is what I do with 30 years of me running the show. That the best that I can do in 30 years is wind up in this guy's camper and always drunk and hungover. That's what I do. And I said, I'm going to let this guy have me for a year. <laughs> and I fell in love with him. I fell in love with my sponsor. All, all weekend long, we've been talking about Bill Wilson. Thank God. I love that man. But I also love Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob writes, he says, if you put half the effort into getting sober as you did getting drunk, you've got a great chance. Man, he had me. He had me at hello. I, I, I'm all for doing half. You know what I mean? <laughs> really? I only have to do half? Sign me up, for God's sakes, man, you know. I can do half, you know. That's all you need is half the effort. I'm all for that, man. And I started following this guy around. And, you know, these first three steps, man, they're just getting us ready. He's getting us ready. This is a, I don't have to wonder what his will is. This is a book of hints. This is a book of hints. Of what God's will is for people like me. And all through that book, he throws out these hints. All through these books. Throw yourself into working with others. Carry this message. That's what he's hoping that I'm going to do with this thing. And I turn my life and my will over to this. And listen how Wilson, maybe not so much to step three, but listen how I love the way Bill talks. Listen what he says here. My friend suggested what seemed a novel idea. He says, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And I thought, my God, my own? And I thought about you guys. He says, that statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. I don't know about an intellectual level, but I know about shivering. I know about having to have, have these blocks about anything that's decent for me. See, I'm afraid of things that are going to be good for me. It's a lot easier for me to believe that I won't make it. I'm sold on that. Don't tell me about hope. It won't work for me. You see, I, I don't have self pity. I have self pity. I ran my life on self pity my entire life. That's my fuel. And he talks about the only matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. I saw that growth could start from that point. A pound of a foundation, complete willingness. I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Would I have what that bald headed carpenter had? That guy's life was falling apart. But he was the happiest son of a gun when he was around me. I had no idea I was giving him hope. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And thus I was convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. I saw, I felt, I believed. How are you going to see that if you ain't in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? How are you going to see that if you're at home in front of the TV? When I began to see you guys, I saw everything that I needed to make me happy. When I began to be a part of this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous and just let you have me, I knew that maybe this little guy may have some hope. The real significance of my experience burst upon me for a brief moment. I had needed and wanted God. There had been a humbling willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been been blotted out by worldly clamors and mostly those within myself, and it had been so ever since. For years I used to think that the experience that Bill had when his high school buddy came over there, when his high school buddy come and visited Bill, and he starts taking him through these proposals. And Bill's laying in that bed, listening to his high school buddy, and then he has the kaboom. The wind through the window. The lights open up. And this guy has what he explained was a, a, a spiritual experience. And for years, I thought that's what was supposed to happen to me. That something was supposed to light up, and I was supposed to have something of that magnitude. It took me years in Alcoholics Anonymous. To find out that the spiritual experience that I was supposed to have was two paragraphs down. Two paragraphs down, Bill Wilson writes, after having that blinding flash, I knew I must work with other alcoholics. Five seconds after he had the kaboomie, he's thinking about helping other drunks. I think that's what he's hoping happens to me, whether it be soon or gradual. That maybe I'm supposed to be getting this thing. Maybe he's getting me ready. Maybe he's getting me ready. Maybe by turning my life and my will over to the care of you and getting rid of some of these defects and cleaning up the record. Maybe this man's getting me ready to do something. That picture with the, the, the guy on the bed and those two guys talk. You think, what do you think they're talking about? You need to work some more overtime? You guys were getting me ready to do something, and I didn't know it. I'm thinking here you're getting me ready to be sober and happy, but you're getting me ready to do something. You got a job for me. And you guys possibly were getting me ready to be the best example of Alcoholics Anonymous I can be for one reason and one reason only. Maybe there's going to be a plumber who's going to waddle up to me and says, I've been watching you for a couple months and you're always here. Maybe just ready, he's getting me ready for something bigger than just not drinking. He's got a job for me to do. I was never spoon-fed Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsor, Johnny, never spoon-fed me nothing. He doesn't care I'm in Las Vegas. He just wants his coffee made on Monday night, man, you know. My real job is in my home group. A power greater than myself. I turned my life and my will over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous. In other words, that third step is, I'm ready to go to work for you. What is it you want me to do? What do you want me to do? How can I serve you? And it is an amazing in Alcoholics Anonymous for people like me that the more you serve him, the clearer he becomes. He wants you to go to work. He doesn't need any more cheerleaders. He needs people to make coffee and set up meetings. Why is that? Because we stumbled upon something several years ago when Bill and Bob were at the Cyberling guest house. Bob didn't even want to talk to that guy. He says, I'll give him 15 minutes and that's it. But because he's a friend of yours, Ann, I'll talk to that man. And he went into the Cyberling guest house, right? Come out four or five hours later and they had a moment. They had a moment, man. They had a moment. They had a moment like me and Don had a moment. They had a moment like the first time I heard my sponsor. They had a moment like the first time we heard Clancy talk about the disease of perception. We had a moment. And that's why we're gathered in our home groups every Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. So that maybe we can create that atmosphere where we can have that moment again. All the miracle of identification. 
Oh, thank God for identification. If I didn't identify with you, there would be no trust. But you would tell me your stories and I trusted you. I trusted that you understood with me. I trusted that you would take me down this path, man, because all I wanted to do was not be that thing anymore. And then I would do whatever you want me to do. And thank God for and man, you know what my little saving grace is? My saving grace, my third step is, is my routine. My sponsor's answer to my third step wasn't go over and pray. You know what my third step was? You gave me a plan of action. You gave me five meetings a week to go to. You gave me my Monday and my 12 and 12, and these were my no matter what meeting. You gave me something to do every morning. I got on my knees and I prayed to this God that I didn't know, but I could see your face. And I prayed that I could see you again that night. I just want to be with you. I am so safe when I'm with you that I just pray that my will and my care to this care of God, and I'll do whatever it takes so I can get to my Monday night meeting. So that I can get to my atmosphere and I get to recreate that atmosphere with my with my little job. That's why I have that job. That's why the seats are up and the literature's out and the coffee is made for when that new man comes into that room. He doesn't have to do anything. Everything's done. The only thing that he gets to do is maybe sit and listen to the sweet voice of a loving God that created himself where two or more are gathered. He'll be there. You told me that, and I couldn't help but see it. I couldn't help but see it unfold in me, and that the thing that I've been looking for my entire life was sitting in front of me on Monday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night, that I was surrounded by this thing. I was, I was looking at the evidence of a miracle. I didn't have to find his face anymore. I didn't have to see him lurking behind a cloud or some crap. I was in the middle of the evidence of a power greater than myself, and I could see it, just like Bill talked about it. He said, I saw it. I saw it. And by God, I was sitting next to it. And I came to believe in you. I knew that you guys just weren't gathering up every Monday to pull one over on me. (laughs) And when I turn my life, every day I give myself to my Father God. Every day I give myself to the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. That thing that keeps us here. And Bill Wilson, man, he talks about that in his book. I knew I had to work with other alcoholics. That's been my spiritual experience. That's what he was getting me ready to do, was work with other drunks. What a blessed experience Alcoholics Anonymous is, to be youthful for the first time in your life. And I know what it's like to get off that beam. I know what it's like to run your old life. I know what it's like to be 10 years sober and have everything come out your sleeve because you got a resentment. I know what it's like to to have that resentment and to have a God and just have faith and leave God out. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be 10 years sober and going to these meetings and your meetings falling out your sleeve because you're going through a divorce and that lady ain't going to get a penny. And you know how that's going to happen? You stay poor at her. You bet. You don't hold a job. You don't pay child support. You show up to pick up your little daughter on visitation and she hops up in your little arms and she's got holes in her underwear and holes in her socks and that's your fault. Oh, but you're right. You're right. And your daughter's paying for it. And you can't hold a job and you you can't make money and you become to have these obsessions of the mind. And then you, any money you have, now you're obsessed with massage parlors. And you're spending $600 a month on a massage parlor, scaring your sponsor half to death. He's at the front door in the greeting line, hoping to smell booze, and he's smelling baby powder and oil all over you, you know what I mean? I know what it's like to have a resentment towards your sponsor. Your sponsor tells you, I I don't want you seeing that woman anymore. And you say, you don't understand. We got really something going on here. And you go against your sponsor's direction. And the longer you have to be right, the less you talk to him. Because you know what he's going to say if you ever bring him a problem. Well, if you weren't living with her, everything would be all right. So you don't bring that up. And you start running your own life at 10 years sober. 
And you're in this relationship and you're not supposed to be in that thing and it starts turning upside down and there's hostility and the the loss of jobs and all this stuff. And your life is just falling apart. And you call that sponsor. He says, why don't you come back home, son? Why don't you come back home, son? Why don't you get yourself a little motel and come back home? And I came back home at 11 years sober. And I made a surrender. I made a surrender that was monumental. Because I knew, drunk or sober, left to my own devices, my selfishness and myself would just kill me. Running my own life. And I come back home. And I got in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous like my life depends on it because it does. Because it does. I used to say things when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous like Alcoholics Anonymous don't work for me. Alcoholics Anonymous don't work for me. And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, it doesn't work for me either. It doesn't work for Pat. It doesn't work for Cliff. It doesn't work for Steve. It doesn't work for Bill. We work for it. We work for it. And you've got to get your head around that. That the more you serve us, the clearer he'll become. There is work to be done here. And he's getting you ready. This is a book of hints. And my third step every morning is, what do you want me to do? And when I began to show respect for the thing that was saving my life, every Monday night and Wednesday, when I started showing respect, for I never showed anything for respect. When I started showing respect for the thing that was saving my life, my meeting, my Alcoholics Anonymous and the people in it, it was amazing. I started having a glimpse and maybe respecting this thing that could be a power greater than myself. Could be a power greater than respecting this thing that gave me life. That maybe he isn't out to get me. That maybe he just needs some work done here and maybe I may be the guy to do it for him. My sponsor, Johnny, used to tell me, just seek ye first the kingdom, son. I mean, what do you mean? I don't read Bible. I don't know what all this stuff is. He says, Larry, put yourself in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Make your sobriety your primary purpose, son. And that the more you put into keeping your sober, the rest of your life will take care of itself, son. And the more you pecker around with your personal life, the more restless and irritable and discontented you need to be. Put all your efforts into staying sober. And looking back over 30 years, that man did not lie to me. I haven't had to go anywhere else to get anything else done. My job every morning is to give you, let me have, you guys can have me. What do you want me to do? And I say my prayers and my little prayers every morning. And I feel so glad that I'm in a routine. I need my Monday and my, and it sounds Something for some, but I tell you, I love my routine because there's nothing worse than being sober and crazy and wondering where you should go on a Monday night. Should I go here? Should I go there? No, maybe I'll just stay home and work this shit out. You know what I mean? (laughs) Been here 10 days already. What the hell's another day? You know what I mean? However, there's nothing more powerful and more secure than to be sober and crazy and know where the hell you're supposed to be on a Wednesday night. Or on a Monday night, in the middle of the people. And what happened to me, the miracle happened to me, and I've been saying this for years. I remember being about seven years sober, and you guys had gotten me under this routine. And I finally got this idea on a Monday morning, I ain't going to my meeting. I ain't going. I've been going to that Monday night meeting. I'm going to finish my plumbing skills, and I'm going to go home and eat pizza and watch a movie. I ain't going. And I took off. I didn't even call my sponsor that morning. I just took off in my plumbing truck, happy as hell that I ain't going. (laughs) I I missed my 7.30 call to my sponsor. He calls me up at at noon. He says, where are you at, jackass? I says, it don't matter. I ain't going. He says, what are you talking about? I said, I ain't going to the Monday night meeting. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care, man. I... And I'm happy as shit about it. I ain't going. I'm driving around fixing drains. I ain't going, man. I ain't going. I ain't going, pal. You know what I mean? I got it. I'm going to have a Monday off, and I don't care what you think, pal. You know what I mean? I, and I'm happy as hell. And I go about my business. I'm popping drains. I'm putting up faucets. Six o'clock in the evening, I roll into my truck. I go into my house. I start taking a shower, shaving, getting ready, 
wound up at the Monday night meeting <laughs> shaking hands with people. I was, what the hell? You trained my feet. You trained my, I'm going to a meeting. I didn't want to go at it. I spent all day not wanting to go, and here I am. You trained my feet, and that spoke volumes to me. That spoke volumes to me. Because how many times at 4 o'clock in the afternoon was it an automatic at Eddie's Liquor Store? It spoke volumes to me. And I knew that there was something here, man. Oh, how I love my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, how I love letting you have me. And if you don't think your seat is valuable and nobody's watching, I got a little story for you. This is how it works. I, I hope Tim from Santa Barbara's here. I hope he's here. Because not too long ago, several years ago, he was working at Central Office. And Timmy gave me a call. And there was this guy coming out of the penitentiary. He wasn't coming out. He was getting transferred. He was getting transferred from Georgia to Lompoc. And he said, Larry, this guy doesn't have any friends, but he's 17 years sober. He says, would you mind writing him when he gets to Lompoc? I said, yeah, I don't mind writing him. And the guy shows up and I, he gave me his address and I started talking to this guy through the mail. Samuel. And I started writing Samuel. And I would write him about my Monday night meeting. I would write him about the third row and the third seat. How I would sit next to my wife and my sponsor. And how you guys would talk. And I would talk about you coming down there. And I would talk about our meeting. And then we started talking about the steps. And I would write him about my first step. And he would write me about his first step. After a while, he wrote me a letter. It had been a year or so. And Samuel writes this letter. He says, Larry, he says, uh, after reading your letter on the 12th step, he says, I'm sitting out in the yard and I'm watching the guys lift weights and play handball. And he said, uh, for the first time in my life, I have a dream. I've never had a dream in my life. I was afraid to go to sleep because of nightmares. But he says, sitting out in the yard this morning with the sun hitting me, he says, I have a dream. And I need to share you that dream. He says, my dream is this, my friend. My dream is one of these days I'm going to get out of here. And I'm going to take the bus from Lompoc to Los Angeles. And I'm going to get the RTD on a Monday night. And I'm going to take that bus to the Monday night meeting in Bellflower. And I'm going to look for the third row and the third seat. And I'm going to come up there and I'm going to hug you, my friend. And he says, I think about it all the time. I think about it all the time. And he says, it makes the days just click by. And man, I never thought much about that. But I thought, my God, the guy's got a dream. And every now and then, I would Monday night, I would look underneath the doorway and see if I see Samuel. He was a black guy. And I used to think that he, when he would write, I would hear Morgan Freeman's voice. You know what I mean? <laughs> It was this time of year, two years ago, I'm sitting at the Monday night meeting. I turn around and this man standing there, this black man. Are you Larry Thomas? I said, yes, sir. He says, my name is Samuel. And the guy picked me up. And that scares me when people from prison pick me up. <laughs> I felt like an hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> but he hugged me like you hugged me, Kenny. He hugged me just like that, man. He hugged me like his life depended on that contact. And I was so glad to see that guy. Just because I wound up in a seat. Because I turned my life and my will over to the care of my home group. The most powerful thing in my life is a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You think about the day you were before you got here. And you think about where you're at right now. And tell me something hasn't moved you. Something hasn't shuffled you right along. You can call it whatever you want. But I call it the sweet experience known to this man. To this man today, that's the sweetest experience is being in your presence. You are everything today. 
From the dinner we had last night, we were planning Steve's funeral last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be a beaut. It's going to be a be- The Bee Gees are going to be there, you know. It's- Spanky and our gang and all kinds of crap. But no four tops, man. And I love being with you. I love what you guys have done to me. Not so that I can stand in the American glow. But every now and then some guy will waddle up to me and says, will you be my sponsor? You see, my primary purpose, man, isn't to be a plumber or be a somewhat trying to be a husband as beautiful lady Rosie that I'm married to. But you see, when I started showing respect for the thing that was saving my life and turning my life and my will, consistency, it's a breeder of faith. Consistency in Alcoholics Anonymous breeds faith. How are you going to believe in something if you keep believing it? This is a memorable weekend for some of the veterans here in Alcoholics Anonymous. People are not even in AA, but this is a veterans weekend. Men who have fought in the war. And I've got this story, and then I'll get out of here because I'm dry in the mouth. (laughs) Not too long ago, they were giving away the Congressional Medal of Honor. And they gave this medal to this guy. I believe his name was Brian. And how Brian, what happened to Brian is in the Vietnam War. The man was in a foxhole with five other guys, and he caught a shell, and it tore off his legs. But he looked over at the hill and he seen his buddy that he was in boot camp with. And he crawled over to see if his buddy was okay with just this. With no legs, he's crawling over this dirt and he sees his buddy over there. And he crawls over to this buddy and he sees a hand grenade coming. And he grabs a grenade with that one hand and he throws it back and it blows off his arm. And this guy's getting the president, elect the, the Congressional Medal of Honor. And this reporter comes up to this man and he says, with all that's happened to you, do you have any regrets? And the man looked at the reporter and he said, son, I don't have any legs. And I got one arm. And if my country wants my other arm, they can have it. My friends... I don't have anything but my time to be with you. And anything you want, you can have. Alcoholics Anonymous is the most beautiful thing that ever happened in my life. And for the people who are struggling with this third step, people like me who have doubts about their God, people like me who who have the, the wandering faith, people like you who always doubt and feel indifferent, all I want to tell you is this. I would rather be a doubter. I would rather be a non-believer and a struggler. I would rather be a man who maybe doesn't know what God is sometimes and can't figure it out and be of total service to you than to be a man who knows everything about God and doesn't lift a finger. Thank you so much.